I saw two more hands. What I'd like to do is ask the two questioners to state their questions in sequence, and then you know Abdurrahman and Hassan can answer answer both of them. That way, uh, that way your questions will be both heard. So please, yes. So we know that the CIA didn't do a good job with predicting the, the new developments in the, in the art world. So at this point, hypothetically, let's say that the White House decided not to rely anymore on the CIA and they are going to hire you as advisors and to predict how the art world will look like in five to 10 years. What do you think? Okay, that's question number one. Keep that question in mind. Question number two. Uh, Tom Sylvester, I wanted to go back to, there seemed to be a difference between, um, of opinion between Hassan and you, Bill, about um, whether the protesters wanted democracy or, or freedom. You said they wanted freedom and democracy. You said, oh, I don't know about the democracy part. So I was just hoping you guys could maybe um, explore that a bit more. OK. Mm -hmm. Those are the two questions on the table. And you, the two of you may answer them in any order, keeping in mind we have six minutes. Uh, I, I tell you, um, I do not think, for, first of all, we can speak of the protesters across the Arab world or even in one locale. Ha as having one set of demands or as having uh, uh, a completely uh, well formulated or well thought of end game vision. This is why actually the, the simple reason I, I made the qualification of stressing freedom as opposed to democracy is uh, from an empirical point of view. What I saw, I, mean, I followed very closely the slogans and uh, the, the writings of uh, the, the protesters and the, the stress, the focus is on freedom. It seems to be assumed, again, whether this is indeed theoretically uh, accurate or not, it seems to be assumed that democratic institutions and democracy will, is a corollary of this demand for freedom, but democracy does not figure as part of uh, the uh, vocal demands. And if I may suggest a reason for that, it might very well be because of the West's uh, patronizing attitude, at least from a, from, a, from a Middle Eastern point of view, on calling for democracy. In other words, these are young people and older people who are stressing the fact that we set our own agenda. Do not tell us that we need democracy. We might need democracy, we might want democracy, but we set our own agenda. Does that mean that if we call for theocracy, we're more likely to get democracy? Well, uh, <laughs> uh, we're calling for theocracy sometimes in here, too. So <laughs> I, I, I don't know. But, but no. The, okay. the, and the, as, as, as to the second question. As to the second question, actually, I would link it to the first. There are too many variables for us to say that this is what the Middle East will look like in five or 10 years. But the, those variables are understood enough by enough people in order for us to say, here are many possible scenarios, and here is what our role would do to enhance one over the other. And I would say, once again, I, I stress that, what the region needs from us is that our actions do not end up being counterproductive, rather than productive actions, but I would have a caveat to that, Libya. We cannot ignore the fact that a murderous regime is engaged in a slaughter of its population using weapons and funds that are partly from us. Well, it's, I think it's, we suspect for the future. I, I think it's, we have to look for one reason. If we look for uh, Europe, we'll give an example. After the Second World War, immediately America is helped through the Marshall and actually protect Europe from two things, from communist, from one part, and also from nationalist in the second part, during the, uh, the sec And also, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, the new was, the, the huge movement was in Eastern Europe for the democracy. Again, actually, the West, especially America, helped them. It was also the new movement of nationalism. Some of countries, even they have they were afraid about the, the, about the civil war, about the ethnic groups in between different countries, because especially in Eastern Europe, there are many ethnic groups. So it was one of, of, uh, of uh, the people actually, especially were afraid about this civil, civil war in among the, the new development. 
but immediately after the support of, of the democracy and uh, establishing the stability in these countries, actually it was quite development in two decades. Why we don't actually this movement in the Middle East can be held to be achieved similarly in the same way it's what has been achieved in the Eastern Europe. I am sure in the beginning will be quite clashes between different groups to take the powers, but I think if it's get it smoothly through, peacefully and through the democracies, I think it will be quite a stability in the, in the region. Thank you. Uh, I have been, if I may say so myself, a model of self-restraint as a moderator. Uh, and it's only because I was asked a direct question uh, that I will depart from that role and offer, and, and offer one, one minute of, of, of concluding remarks. Uh, with regard to the first question, uh, I think much depends on how Iran responds to these events. Uh, because you know, the good news is everything we've talked about in the past 90 minutes. The bad news is that uncertainty and instability constitute a rich breeding ground for outside mischief. Uh, and uh, you know, uh, we went to war in Iraq, and Iran won. Uh, and my hope is that the events of the past three months do not end up inadvertently strengthening Iran's hand yet again. And as, uh, as Abdul Rahman emphasized, that particularly in the Gulf, there is a Sunni-Shia issue, which mm -hmm. is not really the issue in the Maghreb, mm -hmm. uh, but is a really big issue in, in, in the Gulf. And so I think that is the major question mark. The big variable, yes, there are multiple variables. In my judgment, the single biggest variable is Iran. And given where you come from, I suspect you agree with me, but you may not. Uh, with regard to the second question, uh, I think that uh, Hassan and I are not so far apart. At least his last answer uh, is a version of what I was thinking. Namely, there is a lot of daylight between freedom and democracy. And the assumption that the aspiration for freedom leads inexorably to democracy, or the two are synonyms, synonyms of two sides of the same coin, it's much more complicated than that. You know, democracy is a form of government. Uh, it's a form of government that has certain implicit ideals. But first and foremost, if you read the Federalist Papers, it is a way of doing business peacefully uh, with, with, in a civilized manner and with a minimization of the use of force, a maximization of the scope for diversity. That is a very demanding political creed. And it is neither cynical nor condescending to say that many, many times in human history, the abstract aspiration for freedom has eventuated in something other than democracy. And I wish I could be more confident that it will turn out better in this case. I certainly hope it does. We have no choice now but to hope it does and to do everything we can not to undermine the forces that are pushing in that direction, as Hassan has rightly said. Uh, but we should not have confidence that freedom which begins as the aspiration for liberation freedom from will necessarily turn into the particular kind of freedom for that democracy requires. With that, let me thank you uh, for being a splendid, active uh, audience, and especially to our two superb panelists. And so let us thank them. For thank you.